Um, in the next 30 minutes, we'll talk about how uh, attackers are using the entire networking stack. They're going up and down the networking stack, and uh, we'll show you how anomaly detection can help you with detecting these uh, types of attacks. Um, we'll start off with a quick introduction of the current threat landscape, how it's ever evolving, and why uh, there's a need for anomaly detection. We'll follow up with um, a way of uh, really a, a technique that's very scalable. Um, you can use anomaly detection without any uh, big data platform, and we'll tell you all about that. And then we'll end this presentation with a few deep dives in uh, real life attacks, or at least uh, screenshots of PCAPs of real life attacks, um, and how uh, signatures are very tough to match that, but how anomaly detection can still help there. Um, we reserved five minutes at the end for Q&A, but if there's more room, um, please uh, reach out on, on uh, Slack or uh, during breaks or whatever. Fine. But first, who are we? We're all three data scientists within uh, Fox IT and NC Group. Fox IT is the part of NCC that's located in the Netherlands, and uh, NCC is worldwide, and IT is located in the UK. Um, and we're part of the Research Intelligence and Fusion team, um, and that's the whole research part of the group. And uh, that's filled with security researchers, data scientists, um, um, uh, instant response in the free time. Um, so it really makes sure that uh, the whole knowledge hub is there. We believe that the cybersecurity field is so big, so wide, that no, not one person can know everything. So the interaction there is very helpful, especially for us. Um, so we really have to know which anomalies we're looking for. Um, and we love that challenge, the challenge for looking for the anomalies. Uh, but we're really motivated, especially motivated, in getting the uh, anomaly detection into production. Because a, a one-off uh, notepad for, or a notebook for, um, for hunting, that's fairly valuable. But the real value is in automating it, real-time detection, um, and then hopefully ultimate response. Um, and we're also trying to give back to the community as much as we can, what's uh, useful for the rest. So we, um, we um, we're working on a merge request for adding uh, more word logging. Jules will tell you more about that. You see why. Um, we also did some work on parsers for feature engineering for the anomaly detection and uh, a few bug fixes. But first off, the ever evolving TTPs and OPSEC. We saw in the uh, keynote speak already that the cybersecurity field is changing rapidly, or also even more rapidly changing is the TTPs. So, where the blue team starts off monitoring the, the obvious beaconing. Uh, the adversaries are moving to um, including jitter, both in time and data. And then we, on our, our turn, improve, uh, improve our statistical, statistical analysis. So we incorporate the jitters, uh, useful ketosis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and while they move to uh, um, encryption, we move to certificate anomalies, et cetera. Um, and then at the end, um, we move to the hashes, the, uh, the GA3, the, the server hashes, the YARM, uh, server fingerprinting. But then the attackers, um, they randomize the hashes, so that's short-lived. Um, and it doesn't really, not all the attacks move through this entire chain. Some are at the beginning because they don't care about detection. Some are for two steps ahead. Uh, but this illustrates why uh, static signatures are not always sufficient and why you need anomaly detection. Um, but they are using the entire network stack. We did a, a quick summary of 36 uh, APT reports that were published this year. And two of them, uh, 22 of them mentioned HTTP, so still high on the network stack. Um, and that sounds easy, right? Plain text, easy. However, it's still APT. Um, they, they make new malware, they new, make new techniques. So even though it's plain text, you still don't know what to look for. The valid uh, validation, though, is easier. Uh, 22 of them mentioned SSL or any other encryption mechanism. And I think this is the, the area where the current focus is on the blue teaming side um, to make sure to get the encryption right. Um, we saw in the previous talk, Silver Trust, how encryption uh, plays a huge role there. But there's also a significant proportion of these AP reports that uh, create a custom protocol, so custom TCP implementation, custom UDP implementation. Um, and here's the, the area where the current seek logs are not really sufficient anymore. And that's uh, for us the most interesting part, and that's where our uh, talk, will focus on, talk will focus on the most. Um, but moving from theory to algorithms, Matty? Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, thank you, Rich. Um, 
Yeah, so we, when we kind of started out doing this, we were hypothesizing that attackers use the um, network stack, and that might be true. Um, so if you're using advanced attackers, then we, we you know, make the assumption that you bend your tools, but not that you force them. So anomaly detection is, is really key. And um, just to give you a, a sense of how we kind of fit into that, for me, anomaly detection is really a subset of, of pattern recognition. And pattern recognition has a, a really long like, um, mathematical history. And the, we're just very fortunate to live in an age where the, the tools and techniques that kind of underpin pattern recognition continue to improve and, and, and develop. Um, and we use algorithms uh, to define regularities and data and to, to take actions on that, on that data. Like standard caveat, like machine learning is not the, the panacea for all of your um, security woes, but it is really powerful. Like, can you do it well? Um, and just perhaps the maybe a sort of a key message is like the cost of like implementing this is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper at, at an exponential rate, um, and costs both in terms of um, like what's required for the hardware and and do it as well. Um, how to address this stream um, learning. Um, so we, there was a talk last year at Zeek Week using a forest to explore the logs um, UC Davis. It was really good. It's on YouTube. Go and, go and check it out. Um, it got us talking. Um, and one of the things that you know, we, we kind of took away from it was that it was interesting that, I'll give you a quick summary, they were, they were using a, um, a well, one, they were using a sort of a, an isolation forest and a sort of LSTM neural network to, to do their anomaly detection. Um, but they were using it in a, in a batch way. So every... Uh, 24 hours, I think it was, they are applying their model to, to the log. And uh, it was really good, but a challenge with that is that if your anomaly occurs at the start, so you've done your, you, you've run your batch process, well then you're not going to spot that for another 24 hours. And in 24 hours, you can get a long way if you're already inside a network. Um, so that's, that's time matters. Like we're in a business where, where time is really, really sensitive. Um, and uh, streaming analytics really is a, um, think of it as, you're doing your, your analytics on every single event you see. Uh, you can see why I see it might be useful for that. Um, and it, it really kind of aids you then with that, that time in this factor. So bringing it down to, to doing it on every event. I think kind of the other kind of advantages of, of streaming analytics, which are often are not drawn out, is one is the security advantage of it. If you're, if you're not doing, um, applying a model uh, in a batch sense, you can often do it with less compute. Um, so you're not using distributed architectures. So that's a real security advantage. Less Less, less footprint. Um, and there's storage efficiencies as well. You know, as you're doing your analysis you know, on streams, you can begin to make decisions about well, what do I store or what do I not store. Um, as well as drift. So a lot of um, uh, both incremental machine learning algorithms, or um, there are a whole subset of drift algorithms as well, can be used to identify changes in data. And uh, trouble with a lot of the kind of batch trained machine learning algorithms, you have to go away. And you have to retrain it, whereas you know, incremental machine learning algorithms generally begin to adapt the environment. Really, really useful. Uh, Zeek machine learning. So Zeek, we, we love it. Um, we're having a lot of fun with it. And it enables streaming statistical analytics. Right? You, you can do it. Um, it's an events-based architecture, really well suited to it. Uh, when we started looking at how to do machine learning on Zeek, the first place we kind of were drawn to was, was some stats. Um, and uh, some stats is good, but I, I would kind of point out that hasn't really um, achieved any a lot of development since about 2013. Um, so I think when I was looking back at the, the Git commit history, I think Suckle, who actually kind of pushed a lot of that stuff. Um, there's, there aren't, I mean, it changed from Bro to Zeek, but apart from that, there's a, there's a few, few minor changes, but it hasn't changed in, in a long time. And actually, as a field, there's a lot has happened in, in that interim time. Um, so uh, again, like part of the reason we've made the, the journey to come here is we just have chats with people about like, well, what do they see? Where, where, where is some stats fitting in the project going forward? And like, how, how do we contribute to that? We have a couple of ideas around it. Um, however, it does have online mean and it does have online variants. Those are really useful. <laughs> like, um, those are foundational stuff that from which you can do you can do a lot. You could create um, incremental machine learning algorithms in Zeek. Um, and just to be clear, what I mean by incremental machine learning, that's that's really where you're applying machine learning algorithms to, um, uh, to streaming architectures. And um, it is, uh, you could do it all in Zeek, but we don't, and I'll, I'll expand a little bit on that. But um, where, where Zeek really proves invaluable for us is in the whole world of feature engineering. So how can I add more fields to, to Zeek logs, which can aid a, a machine learning model? Um, and we've, we've got really interested in Spicy as well, and um, again, we've, we've kind of added to, to some of the, the um, 
the analysis there as well because we, we see how the rich logs can improve the modeling. I just want to point out two other, um, or, or one open source library that's kind of two, two parts to it called River. Um, and, and really this has become like the, uh, the community for um, people who are interested in this kind of topic of online or, or incremental machine learning. Um, and it's, it's written in Python, not in, not in Seek. Um, I think what, what is quite helpful is there is a, a world of people that are kind of, um, you know, there, is a, there is a nice community around that. And if you're looking to how to, to do this stuff or if you want to you know, go ahead and write it in Zeek, you, you get a lot of inspiration from, from River and, and what's going on there. Most like a one-to-one -one mapping um, with, uh, with River and Zeek is, is online mean. So if I just sort through this very quickly, this is, um, this is average, which kind of triggers me a little bit, dot Zeek. Um, and it is a, well, that's what it's doing. This is a really efficient way of, of calculating your averages. So um, in step one, you, you're just calculating um, you know, a running count. Um, and then in step two, you're, you're updating your mean. So you've only got kind of three values in memory. You've got your, your count, your, your x value that's being added for every incoming event, and you've got your mean. Like this was done in 2013. Which, and the other thing, it's got variance. So um, again, like steps one and two there are uh, the same as kind of what we um, saw on the previous slide. And then you know, step um, three and four, you've really got your, um, your rolling sum of squares, which is uh, how you're calculating variance, so your, your distance, distance from the mean. You're doing this at every step. Um, and again, like Z is doing this really, really efficiently. It opens up a whole world of, world of possibilities. Um, and probably, uh, probably the future of some stats is not a modern machine learning library, but, but there, are, you know, there are different things like Cosys um, or SKU um, or even Entropy, which will have kind of like online variants that, that, that could be really useful within the, the library. I'll just give you a, a bit more of a feel for like how this stuff starts to work. Um, this, there's a blog at the bottom there that was written by one of our colleagues um, who's not here, unfortunately. Um, I think forum stage was, wasn't that loud. Um, so, um, and in, in, um, in that particular blog, what, um, what my geek does is, is, is use a, uh, um, a tree algorithm to uh, look at unusual certificates in an environment. And um, you can go and look at the, the code for, for how that actually algorithm works. It's open, open source. But to, just to walk you through like, the steps, you know, at each kind of stage, you are passing in data. Um, you're then doing something with it. So normally it's a, it's a prediction or some sort of regression on that data. You're then updating your model with what has come in. And then the outputs of that model, you're then forwarding on to wherever it needs to go. Um, so, so those are steps that we see you know, as architecture steps that kind of get re repeated over and over again. But you know, as we began to kind of build through this stuff, um, what we realized is there isn't just one algorithm for, for one problem, um, especially with incremental machine learning being so cheap. You could start to have you know, tens of algorithms or hundreds, even thousands of algorithms that kind of begin to, to work together. Actually, one thing I've really learned from the, from the Zeek project and sort of watching how things are done is the importance of architecture. And um, very quickly, we were like, oh, we need to think about this in terms of a, of a system, not just in terms of a, um, of a you know, get, get your head out of the algorithm kind of, a, of an approach. Um, and just on this slide, like, you know, I'm sure there are other people here thinking through like, how you do this stuff. Um, and there are just like some universal questions that kind of come up you know, time and time again. Like, how, how do you actually begin to join logs together that arrive at different times? How do you stack your models? Because you've probably got you know, the feature output of, of a, a model output could, could easily be a feature input for, for another model. Um, you know, how do you facilitate you know, expert knowledge like, into your modeling? Um, and how do you make actually the model outputs um, available to humans in ways that they can understand and, and do things with as, as well? So there's, there's a whole load, load more, but those are just some things to, to point out. Just as we were talking through this with, with folks, like the, the thing that really, um, oh, there were two things that kind of, kind of came out. One was how do you get Zeek logs to Python data streams? We appreciate that might be quite obvious to some people in the room, but, but just very quickly, one, you can use a, a streaming architecture tool. Um, and you can use all those things there. What, what we generally find is, um, and we do do this at like some scale, is that they're not needed. Um, and they're good until they break, and then they break, and you're like, I've got to fix it. Um, you can then, another way of doing it, and there, there are more than three ways, but like you could just tell the, the Zeek logs that are written to disk. Um, again, there's a, a script there on, on GitHub that can, can help you do that. One of the, the things that's useful about this script is that it helps you deal with um, logs that are rotating, which is, again, just seems to be one thing that, that trips people up as they try and figure out how to, to do this. 
Um, or you could use Broker. And um, uh, I think Python, the Broker Python APIs might be due for a refresh. Christian is nodding, so OK. Um, so if you're going to do this in production, you might just want to wait a little bit before that change. There is an advantage of, of kind of using Broker that you, you then don't have to do all the, the data mapping stuff, which you might have to do if you are kind of tailing the logs in, in Python. So um, yeah, there's a, there is a, a future for Broker um, kind of when, it, when it gets there. Um, and finally, before I hand over to Yus, and Yus has got like the most interesting part of this talk, so like, um, listen in. Um, when like, we were searching out like, how people do this, the thing that you see over and over again is that on, on top of all the machine learning um, kind of modeling, there's normally some sort of expert system. So the moment you begin to combine all of your, your models together, um, you, you still have a, um, a point where you have cutoffs like in your models, and then, and then a sort of combining those, those outputs. Um, that's, that's useful because you can then often combine those, like, you know, those cutoffs with like, indicators or static filters as well to, to reduce sort of like, false positives. Um, but it does pose a problem in that you, you've drawn a line in the sand, and that line in the sand is that anything, anyone with a, an adversarial kind of mind would then abuse to, to sort of stay below radar. Um, and uh, you know, so a lot of our, our current research is like, well, how do you actually get past this whole concept of rule based machine learning? There's a, there's a rich kind of, um, you know, most incremental machine learning is, is fantastic, but really is a, is a footnote in, in the terms of like, what's going on in terms of AI research at, at the moment. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of work around intelligence agents, which is, which is fantastic. Um, it would continue to do a lot of research around the, uh, the problems of, um, of windowing, which seems uh, like a term that people throw around a lot, but is, is a very interesting problem. There's a lot of research as well around um, the idea of the baselining that we're still still working on. So that's some of the stuff we're doing. Um, if you have any questions, um, just go up and chat. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so for this last uh, part of the talk, uh, we're going to talk about how we actually combine these models using an expert system, make it uh, feasible for real-time detection of threats. Also, we're going to discuss how we do this feature engineering in Zeek, and we discuss some of the challenges we see while doing that. All of this we're doing um, according to Zeek. So we give you some examples. So first we'll uh, start off with this one. Uh, it's a screenshot of Wireshark showing some uh, traffic from Empire. Empire is a well-known uh, command and control framework. It's open source, so you can download it, run it on your own. And it works in this way. Uh, whenever you infect a client, the infected client will connect back to the attacker. So in this example, we've labeled the uh, implant the 10.0 IP address. The attacker, obviously, the .37. Uh, so it connects back. It uh, initiates some TLS handshake. And whenever that's co that connection is established, every five seconds, it will send back some encrypted data over that channel. Um, and if we look here, for example, if we would want to write detection for this, you can already see that the timestamps are almost always five seconds apart. And the same applies to the length of the data that's sent. It's almost approximately the same. Uh, so these might be indicators for some model. So what we did here, uh, we edited, um, we added some Zeek script, and we used the online um, uh, variance and mean that Matty just mentioned to calculate some extra fields in the con log. So whenever the connection is long enough, we start to calculate the uh, mean interval between the packets, for example, or the mean uh, amount of bytes that are sent by the client. As you can see, uh, this example has a quite a low variance in the uh, interval also for the originator bytes, and it really comes close to what we just saw in the PCAP. Next to those features that we created, you can also have a look at the other features. So there's the destination IP, which might be very anomalous for this specific network or device. Uh, on the other hand, we also saw an TLS handshake, which also gives us a lot of features. Think of the certificate age, the uh, certificate subject, the issuer, and more and more. So we added some of the X509 uh, fields in the SSL log here, but you'll get idea. So this is the feature engineering we're talking about. What we're doing to detect like custom malware or custom configurations of this malware, we just uh, have different models looking at all of these different fields. The models then combine their outputs or send their outputs to a centralized expert system and then we combine it using logic to detect this. For example here we have the beaconing pattern in combination with an anomalous destination IP in combination with for example an anomalous certificate. Those three things combined make it very powerful. Another example, so in this case an adversary is actually using a custom TCP protocol. Uh, we still see the TCP handshake, um, but after that 
we only see basically the beaconing pattern, still it's around 55 seconds here, uh, but there's not much else. So we don't have the SSL log in this case. Uh, actually, if we map it onto the situation we just described, we only have a handful of, uh, of logs left. So we have the timestamps, the destination IP, destination port, uh, the length, but not much more than that. This is also still in one connection. So uh, the lower you get down the stack, the less, generally, the less data you'll get into your logs, uh, which makes it harder for us to do detection. And in this case, this is still validly speak. So uh, it, it all gets parsed properly. And that's really, if Zeek is able to parse it properly, you'll get really valuable metadata, even in the case of custom TCP protocols. However, we are also noticing that some adversaries are like messing with or moving down this stack. So we just saw uh, TCP and SSL, but they're also going down that stack. So weird logging, also parser errors are becoming more and more interesting as well. We'll just show you uh, some examples of that. So first, anomalies in an application level protocol, SSH. So uh, we start with quiet access. It's actually an SSH backdoor implant. Uh, Mandiant wrote a great blog about it. You should definitely check that blog out. Uh, but basically, whenever the implant is connecting back to the attacker infrastructure, it sets, it sets up the TCP handshake. But then afterwards, it switches to a server role. But then it becomes the SSH server. And that's not a regular case. For example, if we compare two PCAPs, so on the left-hand side, you'll see normal SSH traffic. On the right hand side, you see re the reversed SSH with quite access. It's a lot of data. We're not going to discuss every single packet, but the two, two most important ones are these. So the uh, ecliptic curve Diffie Hellman key exchange. And I looked it up, that should normally be initiated by the client. So Wireshark already shows you on the left that the client will initiate this handshake. However, on the right hand side, you'll see that Wireshark says that the server initiates this. That should, that's already strange. Um, so when we ran this through Zeek, uh, we got the following logs. So you'll see that in the SSH log, uh, that the originator is actually the implant, the attack, it connects to the attacker. Then the client and server are reversed in this case. So we know that the drop bear software is used by uh, the backdoor, but it's, it's listed here as the client. Well, in fact, it acts like the server. So how, um, how did this go? Well, we dove into the code a bit, and then we found this is the, in the bin pack analyzer. Actually, when uh, Zeek observes the key exchange, uh, we'll just pass it through to the is auric uh, Boolean parameter. And the same applies to the reply. And this is correct. If you read the RFC, this is what should happen. In this case, it's actually not true, hence the meme. Um, so what we did here, we fetched this code uh, locally, and we're going to submit that in the next coming days as well to the upstream Zeek. Uh, but what we do then is, uh, whenever we see that the key exchange is initiated by the server, we raise an event. Then it's up to you what to do with that event. But it could indicate an anomaly. Again, what we then do, we use that feature in one of our models, because this could very well be a legitimate feature of some software, we don't know. Uh, so once we have baselined that, whether the reverse SSH connection is normal for this network or for this device, uh, we again combine it with other indicators. So you have a new device in your network, uh, doing a reverse SSH connection to a rare uh, IP and using some anomalous SSH client that might very well be a malicious indicator. Again, that's how we combine these features. It would go lower, for sure. We uh, looked up some, uh, some interesting stuff on the internet. We found this one, BookKit, it's called. It's an eBPF vector of TCP. Really cool, you should definitely check out the source code. It's amazing how it works. Uh, but what this does is the attacker basically sends a specially crafted thin packet to the uh, implant, implant who is running uh, in an eBPF module as, as with high privileges, looks whether the checksum is actually all zeros. When that's the case, it starts to read the command from the TCP options. So you can see here that, it, that Wireshark also raised an error. That's, I don't know this opcode. So again, we uh, ran this through Zeek, and this is the only log we got. Um, so this probably will blend in with all of the other connection logs that you have. It's just one packet, one SIM packet, no response. Why should I care? Well, definitely something has happened. Um, so how could we possibly solve this? We could log all the TCP handshake details. I say we could because that's a really, really a lot of data. Uh, you should definitely reconsider this. <laughs> we could also add more weird.log entries, and that's what we in the beginning mentioned. Uh, we already tried to do that. Uh, we made a pull request a while ago, but 
ourselves to wrap that up and finish it. So we're going to do that also in the next couple of days. Uh, but for example, log whenever there's a weird TCP option that's not known, for example. Um, again, this might result in huge amounts of data. So then again, we use the streaming analytics uh, pipeline to process these amounts. And the last one to end with, just for fun, we asked a colleague of us from the security research team, uh, can you go lower? And he said, well, sure. Uh, uh, and over the weekend, he came up with this. So this is actually a command and control, uh, I think, remote code execution one that uses the last two bytes of the source MAC address with an ARP broadcast. Well, yeah. <laughs> really like the proof of concept. Uh, and even for this, when we uh, ran it through Zeek, it didn't give anything. But there is actually a, an event called bad ARP the trigger in this case, but it's got it has it, it got this uh, orange box at the bottom says that you should enable it. It's not enabled by default because again, I think uh, uh, it generates a lot of data. I think uh, we're almost out of time, so let's go to the summary. Adversaries do use the entire network, network stack. So as Ruth mentioned, they still use HTTP, but they're also uh, using custom protocols. Only detection can really help with detecting these kind of unknown attacks. So if you have a quite a common uh, C2 framework, still if attackers um, edit stuff with anomaly detection, it's, it's still relatively easy to also catch the beaming and the malware in that case. Streaming analytics enable cheap and timely detection. As Matty mentioned, it's just way more cheaper as you're only updating and predicting one event at a time. We found that anomaly detection is really strong in combination with domain knowledge. So anomaly detection alone will generate lots and lots of false positives. Only using domain knowledge uh, will probably lead to missing some, uh, some stuff. Uh, and we found that a, a good balance of that really worked well in practice. Each in the engineering, obviously always important. We do that in, in Zeek, IC, but sometimes in BIMPAC as well. Uh, and we keep doing that. And the last one, obviously, uh, with the example I just mentioned, you only know, uh, you can only detect anomalies with the logs you have. So you can only detect what you see. What you see. Um, so that's why it's important to revise your, to have a look at your weird logging again and check what kind of logging you want and uh, also check the anomalies and the errors that you produce, which are almost as interesting as the other logs. I think that is it for today. Um, are there any questions? Thank you guys for your talk, good stuff. Any questions for the speakers? Don't make me turn up the lights, folks. Come on. <laughs> so you, you sketched a, a quite a range of stuff there, and I, I find it really stimulating here. I'm wondering what you do to sort of hone your anomaly detection so that it's robust in the presence of all the craziness of benign craziness of enterprises. How, how do you tackle the false positives? The positive ones from the model outputs or the, the Zeek logs? Well, when you're working from Zeek logs, yeah. Uh, yeah, and developing various forms of anomaly detection. Yeah, what we usually do is we um, we uh, we have a great team that provides us with lots of actual PCAPs from actual attacks. We run them through Zeek to check um, what will be in the logs whenever we have we would have seen this, um, and then we usually just write models that would catch these kinds of attacks. Um, and you'll always also, the model you're writing will also probably uh, generate false positives, um, obviously. And, uh, but we think that by combining all of the model outputs, so um, having lots of different models, combining them and then thresholding them, for example, or only um, alerting on them in combination with others, greatly reduce the false positive rate. For example, beaconing, uh, really interesting in, in this case with the, with the online mean and variance. Uh, a lot of stuff beacons <laughs> on computers. That's what we found out the hard way as well. Uh, so definitely you have to combine that with, say, an anomalous certificate or an anomalous destination ID. And by uh, adding stuff over and over, you'll reduce the amount of false positives. Probably also will miss other things. That's always the balance you need to find. Um, in this case, we really wanted to get it into production. Um, so then sometimes we just uh, use another model in, in um, combination with to reduce the amount of false positives sufficiently to get it to work in uh, production. Does it answer your question? Thank you. Great question. Yep. Um, 
this is really interesting stuff. Um, so you spoke about Boca earlier. Um, can you speak uh, more about some of the blockers you encountered while trying to um, stream via Broker? I mean, I, um, it's, I think it's guessing, it's guessing there, but like, um, I, I mean, I was doing some testing with the, the Zeek host agent as well, which also uses Broker, and like just uh, when, you, when you fire things up, um, you know, you get thought matches and things like that. So it's, um, the documentation as well, I think is an area that can do really well. Like it's got a ping pong example at the moment, and it's fine, and you can work your way through it, but probably, a lot of people are making that just a little bit more practical might be, can be quite a helpful way of introducing like what, what Broker is. Um, and then I, only from speaking to Christian, so Christian can probably answer this question better than I can, <laughs> like it's going to change. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 this is funny, this was gonna be one of my comments. So, um, so uh, duly noted, and this is, this is a correct assessment, I think I wanted to flag that we're tempted to drop the Broker Python bindings altogether because nowadays you can talk to broker over WebSockets, which is really handy. Um, and we're about to merge some work that will make that in turn more accessible. So if you have other you know, uh, WebSocket-based tooling already available, you basically only need to think about this data model and so forth, and then it gets much easier. So uh, agreed. Cool, other questions? Um, I actually had a follow-up question. Um, did you attempt to do some of this modeling in Zeek? the classification part of it yes um, like the and especially like those things kind of like creep in and lots of people looking at it it was I really like the river community I really like the river community for like you've just got a lot of eyes on the code a lot of people who are interested in it. and it's easy to make mistakes when you're doing that week, right so you can absolutely do it in Zeek some people here really might want to, and if you can, amazing. But um, it's just not not how we keep on it. So, yeah, yeah. and it is the feature engineering side though is where we we really try and see. Thank you. Uh, these libraries that we uh, showed on slides, they come with like tons and tons of algorithms ready implemented. You can use them out of the box. Uh, whilst in Zeek, we only have like online mean and variance, which are very useful. But there's there's so much more in other libraries. So I guess that's their focus. That's why we put. All right, technically there's time for one more question, if it's quick. Yeah, sure. Cool. Oh, all right, yep. that corner is popular. <laughs> and you're all set. Yeah, so this is not exactly a Zeek related question, but uh, have you came across any, like during your research and testing, like some malware that, that throws you off, like they do beaconing, but it's like randomly, like, you know, random time. Oh, you mean uh, like for the, uh, to, to make a model to detect beaconing? Yeah, so you are, Detecting beaconing, but yeah. there's no pattern. They're using some kind of randomization, you know, like to mm -hmm. throw off. Like it's not every hour. We do one hour, or five minutes yeah. randomly. Uh, that that's going to be really hard. We, our model uh, we did not give away our entire model. This was kind of simpler. But we have other beaconing models as well that also uh, take into account some jitter, for example. Um, so uh, yeah, then it's it's more random. In this case, it was just every five seconds. That's the the easy beaconing, so to say. It's more complicated, definitely, and we have other models for that as well. And those are, I think, in Python. Um, but yeah, we uh, that's definitely possible. Cool. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to welcome. welcome Keith on stage. Can we get a round of applause to? Yeah. Thanks.